Hey guys, it's Dr. McJunkin here. Uh, welcome back to Online Learning with Precalculus, where we actually are going to start with content today. So we're going to be jumping, we're going to be jumping into um, probability and statistics for our last unit this year. Um, I made the decision to skip the end of trigonometry to get us some uh, probability and statistics work because it's more aligned towards the ACT, and also this sets you up for success if you go into AP Stats next year. So I'm going to be working through some examples today. Uh, this is lesson one about counting rules. It's going to go along with the first part of chapter 9.6 in your textbook, which is now posted on Google Classroom. Okay, so I, what, how this is going to work generally is I'm going to work through some example problems. I might pause down here to give you some time to work on some problems yourself. So you'll pause the video. And then um, after you look at the examples from this video, there'll be a class worksheet associated with this, uh, with these examples as well, um, where you should be set up really well to do those problems after looking at these examples. And then there'll be an exit ticket or a quiz that you fill out in a Google form. Uh, even though you're submitting your work on a Google form and not actually attaching things in Google Classroom, I just ask that you still click the turn in button on each assignment just so I know that you've watched the video and you submitted that uh, exit ticket or quiz and I know to look for that in the uh, files I'm looking for. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So example one from your textbook on probability and statistics, we're looking at counting rules. So looking at picking eight pieces of paper uh, and they're numbered one through eight and they're put into a box. We're gonna draw one at random record its number, and then we're going to put it back in the box. We're going to replace it. So we have the ab ab ability to um, draw that number again. Then I'm going to draw a second piece of paper. So I'm going to annotate a little bit as I go along. I'm going to draw a second piece of paper at random from the box. And I'm going to record its number as well. And then I'm going to add the two numbers at the end. And I want to know, who that was a lot of text. I want to know the big question is how many different ways can I get a sum of 12? Okay, so the way that I like to do these problems is just to write down, if I can, all the different things that could happen. So if I look at my first number that I draw from the box and my second number that I draw from the box, I want their sum, I want to add them together and I want to eventually get 12. Cool. Okay, so let's start with the largest number I can pick from the box, which is eight. If I picked number eight from the box, the number that has to that I have to draw second in order to add to 12 is gonna be four. So if I draw out an eight, the next one I could draw as a four, I would get a sum of 12. Then I'm just gonna keep going down. The first number I could have drawn could have been seven. If the first number I draw is seven, the second one has to be five to give me 12. If the first number I draw is six, the next number I, that I would have to draw to give me 12 would be six. And this works because I'm replacing the numbers in the box, so I can get six twice, that's fine. Keep going, five could be first, and then I add it to seven. These are different, seven, five, versus five, seven, because the order is different in which I'm selecting these pieces of paper. Still at 12, and then I could go all the way down to four and get eight to give me 12. I can't keep going, because if I had to draw, if I drew a three first, I'd have to draw a nine, which is not in the box. So there are five different ways for this to happen. Let me move that up so you can see it better. There are five different ways for me to have this happen where I get a sum of 12 by picking up two pieces of paper. You're gonna pause the video and quickly redo example one, the one that we just did, but now you wanna get a sum of 14. So I'm gonna pause here for a second, pause the video, do it yourself, come back in a second. Okay, so hopefully you worked on that one. If you did that, I like to write these down again. The first one I could get is, uh, and the second one I could get here, I can write them down. The only ones you should get is six, eight, seven, seven, and eight, six. There are only three ways for you to get a sum of 14, for example, one when you're replacing the numbers. Cool. 
We're going to look at something slightly different for the second one. The, for example, to everything is the exact same except for the words do not replace. So this time, once I select a number, that number is gone. So I can't go, up, go back and draw another, another six if I drew six the first time. So let's go ahead and draw this up again, first versus second number. But all this is really going to be is if I look back at example one, all these numbers still add up to 12, all these pairs, and they're all valid except for one, except for this one. Because I'm not replacing anymore, I can't get six and six. I could get eight and then four. I could get seven, then five. I could get five, then seven. I could get four, then eight. Because each one of these, eight and four, seven and five, those are replaced in between each time that I'm doing it. But six and six can't happen. I can't get two sixes. So I just get the eight, four, seven, five, five, seven, four, eight. And there are four ways for this to happen. Because again, each of these is a separate event, eight and four. I could draw eight first and four second. I could draw four first then eight second. Those are different events that, are, that could happen. Again, you're going to pause the video and redo this one again with the sum of 14 now without replacement. So take about 30 seconds to do that. Pause the video. Cool. Hopefully you're back now. Welcome back. So you've got first and second yet again. And if I want to redo these ones, it's going to look like the last you do example up here. But the one that we cannot have now because it's a duplicate of numbers is 7 and 7. So the only way for me now to get 14 is if I draw an 8 first and a 6 second. Or if I had drawn a 6 first and an 8 second. So there are only two ways for this to happen. Cool. That is just a basic intro on how we can get some of those ideas down. The thing that we want to do, because we don't always want to have to write out every single one of those, is we want to go ahead and use something called the fundamental counting principle. So I copied the definition here for you. So what the fundamental counting principle says is if I've got two events, E1 and E2, the first event has m1 different options or different ways that it could happen, say like the 8 or the 6. After the first event occurs, a second event can occur in m2 different ways. It has m2 number of options. If I wanted to combine those and say how many ways could each of these events happen together, the first one then the second one, I just want to multiply their options together. So I'm going to multiply the number of options. The key thing is I'm going to be using multiplication here, not adding to put these things together. This is really useful when I don't want to have to write out every single example like I just did, like 8, 6, 6, 8, 7, 7. I don't want to do all that. I can still figure out how many different ways things can happen. And this can also be extended to more than two events. Say I have three or four events that I want to happen, and they each have a certain number of options or ways that they could happen. I can multiply three numbers together or four numbers together. That's fine. So let's see how we can use this, because a lot of this up here is a lot of math. Let's go ahead and, and terminology. Let's go ahead and see how we can use it in principle. So I want to figure out how many different pairs of letters from the English alphabet are possible. The way I like to set up these problems is I like to go ahead and draw out the, uh, the things that are going to be selected in this one. There are two things. Pair means two. And I want two letters from the English alphabet. And I want to see how many different pairs there are. What I need to know from the fundamental counting principle then is how many different ways or different options I have for each of these two things. So I need to know how many letters are in the alphabet, uh, the English alphabet, and there are 26 letters, which means I have 26 options for what could go there, A through Z. 
Because it doesn't tell me that I can't repeat letters, I know that for my second letter, there are still 26 letters in the alphabet. So there are 26 options for the second letter, again, A through Z. And all I have to do then is multiply them together to tell me that there are 676 different pairs of numbers to look at here. The fundamental counting principle. I didn't actually want to write out all 676, A, 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 B, A, C, A, D. That would be terrible. Don't do it. Okay. So there's 676 different pairs I can get here. Let's see a more advanced example with telephone numbers. Telephone numbers, we all know, have 10 digits. The first three are an area code, and the next seven are your local telephone number. So I want to know how many different telephone numbers are possible within each area code. So I'm not going to care about the area code. I'm saying within Denver's area code, how many total different telephone numbers could there possibly be? until we don't have any more numbers to give anybody. Uh, and then here's a note that local telephone numbers cannot begin with a zero or a one. I didn't know that. Well, now we do. So if I have a telephone number, it's seven digits. It's three dash four. So my telephone number looks like this. My local telephone number, because we don't care about the area code. Local telephone numbers look like this. Each of these uh, parts can have a zero, a one, a two, a three, a four, all the way up to nine. So if I look at zero through nine, that's 10 different digits. One through nine is nine plus zero gives you a 10th one. So for each of these numbers, there are 10 options for what numbers could go here, except what they told us here, that the local telephone number can't have a zero or a one, so I have to get rid of zero and one. So there's only eight options for the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So I have eight options for the first one and 10 for every other one. If I multiply all these together then, if I take eight times 10 times 10, times 10, times 10, I'm getting tired, times 10, one, two, three, there's six up here, one, two, three, times 10, oh my gosh, so many answers, so so many tens. I get eight times 10 to the six, or eight million different numbers. So eight million different telephone numbers. Whew, that's a lot of telephone numbers. So there's eight million different numbers, Hopefully there's less than 8 million people in a certain area code, otherwise they're out of luck in order to get a unique telephone number. Okay, cool. And one last thing then is we'll talk about what a permutation is getting into tomorrow's stuff. So definition of a permutation. Let me go ahead and get this on screen perfect. Great. So permutation of n different elements is an ordering of the elements so that one is first, one is second, one is third, and so on. The order is going to matter here. So the key point that I gave you is the order is going to matter. It matters if the something is in first place versus second place versus third place. So if I want to find the number of permutations of these, what, one, two, three, four, five, six letters, I want to go ahead and write out that, hey, I want to get, I want to rearrange these six letters so there's six spots for me to put things in. One, two, three, four, five, six, perfect. So when I'm looking at this, I'm gonna go ahead and think about how many options I have for the first one. For this first piece, I could put any one of these six letters, and so I have six options to go here. I could choose any one of them, and let's go ahead and choose E, put E there but there were six total options for me to choose from, but now E's gone. I can't use E, because it's already been used. So here, for the second letter, I can only choose A, B, C, D, or F. So there's only five options here for me. And say I chose C out of those five options. For the next one, 
Again, I'm more restricted. I've already used C and E, so I can only choose between A, B, D, or F. There's only four options here. And say I chose F. As you continue, hopefully you'll see the pattern that then you have three options, which you could choose, say, D, two options, choose A, and then lastly, there's only one option left. You gotta put that last letter here. What the fundamental counting principle tells me is that if I multiply all these options together, the six options, the five options, the four options, the three options, the two options, the one option, if I get six times five times four times three times two times one, that will give me all the total options that I could get for rearranging these letters, which is 720, 720 different ways or permutations where order matters to rearrange these letters. We sometimes call this six factorial instead of having to write all of this out. So let's go ahead and look at the permutation formula down here where you see this new thing called a factorial, which is an exclamation point. Yes, now exclamation points are part of math. Math was just numbers, then it was letters, now there's punctuation. So six or six factorial is our answer here because that represents six times every number less than it. So the number of permutations of n different things, like we had six letters earlier, is n times n minus one, because we have less options for the second one, times n minus two, et cetera, all the way down to one. So n all the way down to one, and the notation we use is n factorial. You can find this on your calculator, generally under your math button or a probability button. So this factorial represents the number times everything less than it. So let's go ahead and evaluate a couple of these quickly before you guys get to your classwork and work on this. So for 12 factorial, they use this notation because they really don't want to write out what it is, which is 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 whew, times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Hated that. Use your calculator on your uh, factorial button. You should get 479,000,600. Crazy. For these other two, I want to highlight some misconceptions. You may think, hey, I've got six factorial here divided by two factorial. Why don't the factorials just cancel out and the six and the two cancel out and just give me three? No, that's not how it works. Because let's see why. Let's go ahead and actually write these out. This one I will write out just to uh, show you the misconception. Six factorial is six times five times four times three times two times one. 2 factorial is 2 times 1. Some things do cancel, like these 1s and these 2s can cancel, but my answer isn't 3. My answer is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3, which is 360. So be careful. Factorials don't cancel out, and you can't cancel out the numbers. They're kind of stuck with the factorial. And then lastly here, you might think, hey, 3 factorial times 4 factorial, ugh, that's 12 factorial. Dr. Junkin already did that one for me. I know the answer. Not true. Let's be careful with these again. 3 factorial represents 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial represents 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And if you multiply all that together, you get 144, which is much, much smaller than 12 factorial was. Great. So I know I went through this really quickly, but there's a lot of stuff to look at. Um, as we look through the rest of probability and statistics. What I will do now is encourage you to watch the video again if you need to see any more examples. The best part of this is you can rewatch the video, you can slow down the video, you can speed up the video, you can pause the video in order to really get these notes. So I will move pretty quickly through these lessons because you have the ability now to pause and rewind and things like that. So after this video, make sure that you're looking at the classwork and then you, the exit ticket that's associated and you're making sure that you're clicking turn in uh, button when you're done with that exit ticket. The exit ticket will generally just be you submitting some of your answers and work from the classwork. So you kind of get to kill two birds with one stone as you
do some work to practice, and then eventually submit that for your classwork for the day. If you've got any questions, I'll be uh, on office hours from 2.45 to 3.45 today. Hope to see you there. Have a good one, guys. See you on Friday.